Hi, this is Ron Sipsick, and this is the fourth part of what has become a four-part series in cost behavior. In this particular segment, we're going to tie the concepts of cost to the concepts of profit and production. And we're going to come to some very interesting conclusions. Let me begin with a question, really a true-false statement. How would you answer this? Quote, with a fixed plant size, a profit-maximizing firm maximizes its total profit by maximizing its output rate. Take a minute, well not a full minute, but take a moment and ponder that. The answer is... False. The goal of the profit-maximizing firm is not to maximize its output rates. The goal of the maximizing firm is to maximize its profit, total profit. We're going to learn, and we're, in fact we'll see this lesson over and over and over again, that firms do not maximize profits, their total profits, by maximizing output rates or even maximizing price. Hmm. How do we get at these ideas? Well, we need to bring the cost data that we developed in segment number three together with some price data, and we'll be able to explain why this statement is false. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to build a little table and show you some calculations, and I will, in the, in the process of doing this, prove the, the statement that we just went over false. Okay. Now, let's say we're evaluating two output rates. Let's evaluate the output rate of 45 and the output rate of 47. In our, uh, and these numbers are taken from the data we developed in segment number three. Price minus average total cost is going to give us something called average profit. Average profit times Q. This could be a loss. Let me step back. This could be a loss if average total cost is greater than price. Then this is actually an average loss. But we'll assume a profit. In, in this case, it is going to be a profit for this firm. So average profit times Q, any average times Q is going to give us the corresponding total. In this case, total profit. Okay? Now, let's assume for the sake of argument that this firm can sell its product widgets at a price of $20 a widget if it's trying to sell 45 units and that the firm could sell 47 units for the same price. In other words, this firm does not have to lower its price to sell more. And this type of firm is actually called a purely competitive firm and I will be discussing pure, pure competition and the purely competitive firm in a future lesson. So you just have to take this by faith that there are firms that can sell as much as they want so long as they sell, a cert sell at a certain price. Let me say that again. There are firms out there that can sell as much as they want, in this case 45, 47, or 107, whatever it is, so long as they charge a certain price. So the issue here is not price. We're just going to take price as a given. We want to evaluate our cost data, <coughs> excuse me, our cost data against this price. So let's go ahead and put in our cost. The average total cost for producing 45 units, this is taken directly from the table we developed in our last lesson, is 1476. The average total cost of producing 47 units, if you recall, is 1532. Now later on we'll talk about why that average went up. Sometimes the average total cost number actually goes down, but here it went up. But that's, again, not the issue. So what is our average profit? If we take the 20, subtract 1476, we're going to get $5.24. $5.24 is our average profit. Again, I remind you, averages say nothing about a particular unit. They say something about members of a particular group. The average total cost over here is going to be $4.68. Now, if we take these averages 
and we multiply them by their corresponding Qs, we're going to get what? We're going to get the total profit in this case. So 524 times 45, 468 times what? Times 47 is going to give us the total profit. Now, we're going to get three, excuse me, we're not going to get three. We're going to get 23580 as our number here. And I want to point something out. This was rounded. So this is rounded, and this was rounded, and then multiplied by a factor of 45, which now means this is very rounded. You multiply something by a factor of 45, and whatever little error it has in it, it's going to be 45 times larger. Think about that. Now, if we actually used another method to calculate the total profit, which I'm not going to show you right now, we would discover that this is actually 236 even. In fact, I can actually show that to you some other time, but um, let's just take my word for it. This is actually 236, but because of the rounding error, uh, you end up with 235.80. If I were testing you on this, worry not. If you gave me 235.80, I would be extremely happy with that answer course if it's properly rounded and presented. Now 1532 is also a rounded number which means 468 is a rounded number multiplied by 47. If you multiply those two numbers you actually get 21996 and that 2 is off. This really should be 220 even. The rounding error was not as great so the resulting difference between the two numbers is not as great. Now Really, we, let's get to the point that this lesson is about. True or false? True or false? With a fixed plant size, in this case, this firm has 16 machines, and 16 machines doesn't change throughout the, the problem, so the plant size is fixed. This firm, XYZ, which we've assumed is a profit-maximizing firm, maximizes its total profit by maximizing its output rate. Well, we had determined earlier that the maximum out or output rate this firm could get from 16 machines in the short run is 47 units. This is the maximum output rate. You'd have to go back to segment two to review why that's the case, but this is the maximum output rate assuming you have 16 machines and 16 machines is fixed. As we moved from 45, though, 45 units to 47, look what happened. Our total profit went what? It went down. Why? Why wouldn't producing more units mean more profit? That's the question. Let's look at it. Something happened between an output rate of 45 and an output rate of 47. Something happened with the 46th and the 47th units. Something happened. What happened? Marginal benefit, marginal cost. What's the marginal benefit of each of those units? Well, each of those units bring us in what? $20 of revenue. Each of those units can be sold for $20 each. So each of them bring us in $20, but what do each of them cost us? Each of them cost us $28. If we go back to our cost table in segment number three, we learn that each of those units cost us $28. So what did we lose on each of those units? What did we lose? We lost $8 on the 46th unit. We lost $8 on the 47th unit. We lost $16 on both of those units. And that explains the drop in $16 between here and here. Should the firm produce units, should the firm produce units when the marginal cost is greater than the marginal benefit? 
The answer is a resounding no. Now, let's go back and review a few things before we conclude this lesson. Back in unit, back in topic number three, we, we remember that when we added, when we added the sixth worker, by the way, that worker is equally productive compared to the fifth, fourth, third, second, first workers in terms of training, education, sobriety, uh, the state of whether being drug free or not, how awake the worker is. Worker six is of, is of equal quality with all the other workers that were hired. But if you recall, the marginal productivity of the sixth worker was very, very low. Why? Because of the law of diminishing returns. What we're saying is six workers could only produce two more units than five workers could produce. So when we added the sixth worker, the sixth worker joined a group of five workers, and when that happened, total cost went up by, there's the change in total cost, total cost goes up by 56, but Q only went up by what? Q only went up by two. Remember, marginal product is really the change in Q. So when we added, this is the marginal product of the sixth worker. When we added the sixth worker, the sixth worker added what? Two units to our output rate. Meaning, those units were very what? Very, very expensive. Those units cost us what? $28. And if you recall, when I presented this, I said that that $28 is not an average. That refers to two specific units. Units 46 and what? Unit 47. So here we've produced two very expensive units and in doing so could not sell them for a price greater than their cost and therefore by producing them we actually reduce our total profits. Now we can we could actually graph this and as long as I've got a little bit of room left here in the lesson and maybe a little bit of time and maybe just a little bit more of your patience let me show you this graphically. Now some of this I haven't covered yet with a video so you just have to take my word for it. Let's get rid of that. So Let's set up a two-dimensional space here. Dollars here, output rate here. Now, I haven't explained this yet, but let's say the price is 20, which is what we assumed in this example, and the firm can sell as much as it wants so long as it charges this price of 20. We'll learn that when we study pure competition that the market market forces determine this price and the firm finds that if it sells at this price it can sell as much as it wants but if it tries to charge more than 20 it can't sell anything because there are literally zillions of producers out there producing exactly the same thing at the same price so it's not possible for the firm to go above 20 if the firm tried to do that it'd go from selling all that it wants to selling nothing and the firm of course would have no incentive to charge less than 20 to undercut the market because the market will bear 20. The firm can sell as much as it wants at 20. Why would it try to sell as much as it wants at 18? That would make no sense. So this is actually called the demand curve and marginal revenue curve. This is actually a purely competitive producer. And again, I have not explained any of this. You just have to take my word for it. Now, let's put our cost curve in here. This is our average total cost curve. And find the minimum point. Our marginal cost curve will cut our average total cost curve at its minimum. I have not explained that yet with a video, but there's a very high likelihood that I will. Stay tuned. Now, 
where should the firm operate to maximize its profits? Well, we're going to learn that you maximize your total profits if you operate where MC equals MR. Okay? So if the firm produces a unit that has a marginal benefit of MR, let's say 20, and it has a marginal cost of 20, it would break even on that particular unit. But notice all the units prior to that point, all the units prior to that point, what is true? Those units are all what? Costing less than 20. See, there's the marginal cost curve. There's the marginal revenue or marginal benefit curve. We've called, in our example, we've actually called marginal revenue the marginal benefit. Why? Because it's the marginal benefit. It's just not called marginal benefit. It's called marginal revenue. Okay? Now, in this particular example, and I really don't have time to develop this um, completely, but you'll, again, you'll have to take my word for it. If the firm were to operate, let's say, at an output rate of 45, it would be here. I'm not going to prove that. You have to take my word for it. And it would still have room to move up. Okay? In other words, it would be slightly underproducing. But if, the, if this firm chooses to produce at 47, it's actually producing somewhere out here. And sure enough, by moving from 45 to 47, its total profit has actually what? Decreased. Why? Because now it's operating out here where MC is what? MC MC is greater than MR. Can you see that? There's MC. There's MR. And now the firm is producing where MC is greater than MR. That means it's overproducing. Ego firms can never overproduce. Shouldn't they produce as much as they can from a fixed plant size? Come on. They should try to turn out as many widgets as they can. As many widgets as they can. As many widgets as they can. They should try to produce every widget they can out of it. This is a world of scarcity. We should be trying to be produce, producing every widget we can out of a fixed plant size. False. 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 The firm never wants to produce a unit that costs the firm more than it benefits the firm. That is a socially invaluable unit that costs the firm more than it benefits the firm. Society should not be producing widgets, gadgets, or anything for that matter that costs society more than it benefits society. And folks, that in fact is the moral of this story. Up here, why did this firm's profit decrease? It was profitable at both output rates, but it what? It moved beyond the point where MC equals MR. It began to produce units that was what? Costing it more than it was benefiting the firm, and the, units to and the firm's total product decreased as a result of that. Total profit decreased as a result of that. Okay. I believe there will be a segment five in our three-part uh, three series. Stay tuned.